dokey. Um, hi, everybody on Facebook. Um, my name is Cassidy Robinson. I'm one of your admins for SoCal Loopers. And tonight we're talking about the psychosocial aspects of looping, how we can have such great do-it-yourself tech, but still feel super burnt out um, and experience diabetes distress. So let me share this presentation with you all. We're going to start out tonight by re reviewing our, our team rules, um, which we do every week which are, um, <laughs> I love taking over for Joanne and doing this part. <laughs> then please raise your right hand and commit that the loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm and user interface. It's developed through the work of community volunteers. While it may seem obvious, please consult with your healthcare professional or professionals regarding your diabetes management. It is important to note that this project is highly experimental and not approved for therapy. So you take full responsibility for building and running the system and you do so at your own risk. Um, so <laughs> thank you for all those hands I just saw. <laughs> um, like I said, tonight we're talking about uh, psychosocial burdens of looping. Um, our hosts tonight are Syra Gallo. Do you wanna wave Syra? Sarah Goya, Joanne Milo, myself, um, and we have our SoCal Loop admins, Glenn Weber and Kenny Fox on. They're gonna be helping us um, feed in anything that's coming in from chat. So if you have questions during this presentation, if you have any comments during this presentation, I hope you have a ton of comments and I also hope you have a ton of tips because we're trying to help one another out here as much as we possibly can drop them in on the Facebook Live comments and we can feed them in to discuss. Okay, um, so before we deal with uh, what could be considered a very heavy issue, which is diabetes burnout, we should start out with props. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are giving props to the people, the hardware, the software, and also all of the community leaders that have made loop and open APS possible for all of us. There are countless hours of development and community management um, aiding and building systems for people both in person and strangers on the internet now that COVID has hit um, that have gone into making this technology available for all of us. Um, and a new update as of, I don't know, Joanne, you released this with your blog today, but I think this was Last week. Or at least as of last week. Mm -hmm. um, psychosocial aspects of automatic insulin delivery systems are super, super, super hot in FDA's mind right now. Um, and so Inspire questionnaires were actually approved as part of the MMD uh, therapy, like accessible therapies development. So from the Inspire questionnaire's approval for their qualification, they said that the following 10 benefits of using automatic insulin delivery systems were consistently reported within all of their questionnaire takers. Um, so here we go for props to this wonderful tech we're using. This tech reduces mental burden, decreases daily management burden, lowers HbA1c levels, improves glycemic control, reduces glycemic variability, increases the accuracy of our bolus calculations, it's a big up in my world, um, improves our health benefits, improves our quality of life, our quality of sleep, um, and also we're able to trust the system to manage our diabetes on behalf of us or in conjunction with us. So those are like very, very big props to these systems. We love them so much, it is why we have a dedicated Southern California loopers group. We love them. Um, um, but um, but um, a note on the questionnaire because of a lot of discussions happening about um, diversity and especially diversity in medicine and medical research. Um, the one thing the FDA noted was that although the prevalence of type 1 diabetes is highest among Caucasians, it still affects people of other races and ethnicities. Nearly 78% of the people in the study for the Inspire questionnaires were Caucasian. 
So let us asterisk that these Inspire questionnaires, um, which were taken by a number of people pulled from uh, T1D Exchange, need to be studied and researched on people of color. Um, all right, so <laughs> adequate props given. Please remember those props should any <laughs> developers be or <laughs> admins be listening to this presentation later. Let us get to burnout, which is what we're here to discuss. Um, so we should start with what is diabetes burnout? And as it's called by the CDC, what is diabetes distress? And how do you know if you're experiencing it? So <clears throat> diabetes distress, um, which we in the community call diabetes burnout, is defined by the CDC as overwhelming feelings, including feeling discouraged, worried, frustrated, or tired of dealing with the daily diabetes care, which can cause you to slip into unhealthy habits. Um, they noted that in any 18 month period, 33 to 50% of people with diabetes experience diabetes distress. That's people with all types of diabetes, not just type one, important to asterisk that, but also really important, potentially half of people with diabetes are experiencing diabetes distress within any 18 month period. So this is definitely something that we should be talking about. I know within the admins of SoCal Loopers, this <laughs> came up because I was on a bullet train headed right into diabetes burnout. And um, my like fellow presenters and admins here really helped pull me back into normal, wonderful management um, and healthy mental habits. So what we want to share is that you can notice diabetes distress, diabetes burnout, um, manifesting within your daily diabetes management if you are missing insulin injections, if you are experiencing sloppy insulin calculations, those kind of like, my blood sugar is high, rather than looking at my sensitivity or seeing what loop suggests to me as a correction, I'm just gonna give two units because I feel like it, because I'm upset. Um, you'll also notice missed CGM calibrations. A lot of people in our group I know that are actively commenting are using G6, so you may not be experiencing that, but for those of us using other CGMs, missed calibrations are a pretty good marker that you are headed toward diabetes burnout. You'll also notice roller coaster blood sugar swings, um, highs and lows, highs and lows, highs and lows, that are probably directly tied back to those sloppy insulin calculations and some sloppy, um, like just food eating habits of like going toward our comfort foods immediately without bolusing or pre bolusing for them. Finally, missed medical appointments. Um, I know when I was a teenager experiencing diabetes burnout really heavily, this was the go-to move, was don't get called out by your physician. Just don't go to your physician so you don't get called out by them. So um, we see all of these things happening in diabetes distress, but especially when it comes to loop, we, I will say for myself, I feel like I am using the best technology that there possibly exists in the world to manage diabetes right now. And it's still shocking to me sometimes that I experience the amount of burnout that I constantly am experiencing or generally the amount of frustration that I experience. Um, I feel like this is shared. <laughs> um, I, know, I know that like from one of our admins can share some of these experiences from today. Um, so we've identified a handful of elements of loop burnout that we can discuss a little bit further. Those include hardware and charging, your supply management for your loop supplies, alarms, your loop settings, carb counting, and your medical care team. So when it comes to hardware and charging, we have a number of items that we have to like have on us at all times, right? Like I have my phone, I have my Riley link, I have an insulin pump on, I have a CGM sensor. It's not enough to just have them on us though. We have to know, are those things working? Are they charged? Do they need to be changed? And are they actually near me? Um, it is, what I have found really easy in my life, I'm doing it right now. I'm going, is my Riley link actually on me? Well, I know it's in my pocket because I have a green loop, but it's amazing how often this thing gets left behind on a table anywhere within the house when I'm working like out in the garage. 
Next, we have supply management. We have a lot of supplies to manage. Um, <laughs> insulin, obviously, being the most important of them. Infusion sets. Um, your infusion sets, if you're using Medtronic looping or your pods, if you're looping with Omnipod. If you're using Medtronic, those reservoirs, right? Like, keep them around you at all times. <laughs> your test strips, your alcohol swabs, alcohol swabs that, that were so hard to get a hold of at the beginning of COVID are so important for those of us who are actively putting needles into our bodies. Um, Lancets, even though we might only change them like once a decade, still gotta have them. That thing's gonna be super dull eventually and you may wanna change it. And finally, glucagon. Though this technology is incredible, it is obviously still possible to have a severe hypoglycemic event and you better like have a prescription for glucagon on or near you that's not expired. Um, it's really important. In handling all of those things though, you have to say like, it's not automatic that we get these. Um, Ann Peters mentioned attempting uh, at our meeting in Santa Monica earlier this year. She mentioned attempting to get a package or a bundle of supplies given alongside a type 1 diabetes diagnosis where we would just be immediately handed these things once we get diagnosed and obviously we all know that's not the way that insurance is set up in the United States so when it comes to all these supplies do you have access to them do you have backups for them and are you prepared in an emergency with enough backups and enough immediate access so that you can actually keep your loop running? Um, then we're dealing in software and connection, which um, was, I know in my personal experience, starting to use loop a number, two and a half years ago. Um, this was the most frustrating element and I feel like the red loop is still the most frustrating element to me. We need to make sure that our loop version is updated and that our iOS version is updated and oftentimes not too updated, right? We're all actively involved in this conversation about the next iOS update and when we will be able to update our loop apps after. So we need to know, is our phone updated? Is our loop version updated? Is there an active connection in loop? And why the heck isn't there an active connection in loop, right? We expect to just like put these, I know I expected to start looping and if I carry my phone with me and I carry my Riley link on me, it should be active all the time. I should never get out of a green loop. And that's not the situation. So when I'm entering into a situation where my loop connection has dropped, all of a sudden, I sit around my house going, why am I crying? And why do I want to throw all of these things out of the window? It's super, super, super frustrating to deal in those moments. <laughs> Next, we have um, alarms, right? Our continuous glucose monitor data is so drastically important to the successful operation of our loop apps. Um, but continuous glucose monitor data on their own play like wild psychological games with a lot of us, right? Am I rising? Am I falling? Am I high? Am I low? Am I super high? Am I super low? Am I actually waking up to my alarms in the middle of the night? Do I sleep through them? Am I acting when I hear alarms or do I just kind of like hear them and continue going on in my life? Uh, are my alarms alerting my partner, my dog, my cat, my lizard, like is someone else hearing these alarms and responding to them? Am I annoying them because someone else is hearing these alarms and is being woken by them in the middle of the night? These are all issues that we are all dealing with um, outside of the, how wonderful the tech is. It's so great that we have those alarms to save us, but they come with a cost to our mental health. Um, we also have settings to deal with and so happy to have Kenny Fox, um, <laughs> the king of helping us dial in our settings. And if you are new to SoCal Loopers and you have not watched all of Kenny's videos, um, I think, what was it? Five, one through five or one through six. 
those need to, you need to watch them because Kenny's knowledge on adjusting settings is um, like having a genie in your diabetes pocket. But there's a lot of solid settings for us to be dealing with in loop, right? How many basal rates do you have and how many should you have? Are your basal rates right and have you tested them? Do you know how to do a basal test? That's not a dumb question. You can't adjust your basal rates appropriately if you don't know how to basal test. Um, how many ISFs should you have? Are they actually important? Um, do you know the things that make you resistant to insulin or sensitive to it? Um, and do you have a concept of how long that sensitivity lasts? Is that sensitivity consistent? If you go on a one mile run and let's say you go on a one hour run instead and you become insulin sensitive, does that sensitivity last for three hours or does it last for six? And if you go on a one hour run tomorrow, are you gonna, is that sensitivity the same or does it change? These things, these are things that we play with in our minds all the time sometimes without even realize that we're doing it. Um, our carb ratios, are they right? How many do you have? Should they be different for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Um, if I eat a midnight snack during like insomnia, do I need a specific carb ratio for that? Is my carb ratio different? Is my sensitivity different in the middle of the night than it is during the middle of the day? And our target ranges. Um, I know one of the things we talk about often, and I feel like we go back and forth on in loop group is, do you want a stagnant target? Do you want something, do you want a single number? Do you want something with variability? Do you want to give yourself a really wide range or really small range? And where are you setting it, right? Are you putting yourself at a level that is optimum for your management and long-term health, or are you trending a little bit too low, trending a little bit too high? Is your goal just a little bit off? And will those cause, cause complications for you in the future? Um, carb counting. <laughs> I think a thing that we all know so well, I feel like almost no one loves to do, um, which is so central to our lives. I was explaining it just, um, earlier today to my partner and it's amazing how complex carb counting can be um, do we have a food label when we're carb counting how wonderful it is when we have a food label when we're carb counting do you trust the information on the label um, is a question that i don't <laughs> feel like we talk about a whole lot but it's a really important question um, if you don't have a food label, right, if you're eating mixed meals and they're mostly produce, how much of that are you Googling to find out those carb counts and how long is the spreadsheet that you're doing those calculations on? Um, if you're using a food tracking app, are you actively entering all of that information in the food tracking app and also in loop? Um, how often are you forgetting to put it in one place or the other and forgetting to put it in which one of those places is more important and impactful to you? Um, when you're eyeballing food, which I am sure I am not the only person in this meeting who does that, um, are you eyeballing a cup or is that actually a half a cup? Is it a cup and a half? Um, if we're not actively practicing these things, it's really easy to get slippy and slidey when it comes to measurements. As we're making food, um, am I supposed to count the additional two, three, five, ten noodles, penne noodles that I'm eating as I'm cooking? Do those get added to my carb count or am I cool to just like skip them? Um, especially when we're talking loop specific food absorption times. Did you choose the right segment of absorption? And then did you choose the right absorption time to alter that by? Um, I'm doing an informal study right now and for the first time used an eight hour absorption on a food. I'm like, oh, is this right? I don't know, it took multiple days to figure out that it was close enough to being right to work. Um, when you're having a high blood sugar, is it because you totally messed up your carb count 
because you forgot to enter a carb, because you got super stressed out, because all of a sudden something sneaky was in there. Um, were you at Thai food with your aunt and you ate glass noodles and didn't realize that they're super high in carb and for some reason you entered like 15 carbs for a cup of glass noodles. Um, I recommend no one make that, mis <laughs> that mistake. I can do that for all of us. And then finally, your medical team and your medical care, right? We are all living in a really strange moment using this technology. Do you have a diabetes care team that will actually talk to you about your use of loop? Because though, <laughs> though it doesn't to me after 27 years of diabetes feel that impactful that my care team will not speak to me about using loop, it is actually really important when you've been raised on a system that's supposed to help give you advice every three months. It's really, really, really impactful when they go, well, we can't give you any advice. You're doing something that's not FDA approved and we can't help you with that, right? Thank goodness for these um, Facebook groups for those of us in that situation, because how stranded would we be if we didn't have one another? Does your care team know what loop is? Um, in our SoCal Loopers meetings, I know we are now starting to get um, many more practitioners, which is wonderful and super exciting. And even if they don't know it, lights the admins like fire. We love that. That's great. Please invite all of your coworkers to also um, come watch these talks. Because more often than not, than not we're going to encounter care teams that have no idea what loop is. Um, that maybe generally know what an automatic insulin delivery system is, but they don't know the specifics of operating them. We don't really expect them to know the specifics, but they should try, right? Our care team should try for us. Will your care team help you adjust settings, right? If they know what loop is, if they are actually semi-trained in how to use it and how to operate it maybe part of members of your care team use loop or have tried it experimentally if they aren't a t1d can they help you adjust your settings that's awesome please if they are leave that in the comments because we just need to send everybody to like that care team um and finally is your care team supportive dismissive or like informed at all about loop because it's very clear that this is the way diabetes management is going, is the use of automatic insulin delivery systems. And if your care team is dismissive or uninformed about them, it doesn't spell good things for you and your medical future. It also doesn't spell good things for them and their practices future. Um, cool. So <laughs> despite the fact that we can give all of those props to loop and to do it yourself technology, it's no freaking wonder that we can face burnout because that was a whole lots of elements <laughs> of things that we think about all the time. And maybe we don't think about those things constantly. Maybe we don't think about all of them every day, but it's not long that we go without dealing with them. So let's uh, try and, <laughs> the center I really feel like of this discussion tonight is, let's try and help each other out to avoid getting into burnout in the first place and to help one another get through burnout once we're experiencing it. Um, as I mentioned, I was like on a silver bullet headed towards super burnout. I was walking around the house saying that um, and I was, I'm thankful enough to have the world's best diet buddies because I didn't go as deep into my burnout as I possibly could have because a lot of these techniques were used. Um, so we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna, um, I'm super thankful to like have Syrah, Sarah, and Joanne to help talk about these. And we'll probably go into a little bit more of just like a looser discussion on these larger topics. And if anyone has anything to say in the Facebook Live comments, please chime in. Um, and we can build out some tips on here and like release these later to everybody. Um, so we can start with some general, just like, let's make diabetes life every day easier for ourselves so that we don't tip into burnout. Um, and that starts when we like open our eyes in the morning. <laughs> 
Um, so I know for me, one of the things that I have to be really mindful of is the fact that when it comes to loop and it comes to Dexcom app, I will check those things 24 seven all the time, starting with the first second that I open my eyes when I wake up. Um, and it's really not good <laughs> for uh, my mental health if I'm starting the day off judging myself based on my blood sugar. Um, so it's my personal habit that when I start the day, I go to the bathroom to brush my teeth, my hair. I like snuggle the dogs. I'll do anything. I'll moisturize. I'll trim my nails. I'll do anything to give me 10 minutes in the morning before I pick up my phone to check what my blood sugar is. And that's the first thing I'm doing. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to check if I have an active connection, what my blood sugar is. And then I'm just going to put it back down if my blood sugar is fine, or I'm going to totally freak out um, and have to like make a management decision if my blood sugar is high. Um, and then my like, a thing that took me a really long time to do, which sounds really silly now, was to recognize my morning ritual and actually address it <laughs> in a way that was based in analysis. Um, I drink coffee every single morning as the first thing I do when I go downstairs. <laughs> um, after I can like brush my teeth and put on moisturizer, check my blood sugar, I'm going directly to the coffee pot. And so it took me a while to figure out that being able to bolus for the cup of coffee I have in the morning and being able to bolus for it correctly helps me start my day out actually fairly normal and consistent every single morning. So my recommendation to all of us is to sit down, address what your morning rituals are, and then get a plan of attack for dealing with it so that your blood sugar stays even keel, whether that's a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, walking your dogs, um, doing 10 push-ups. Uh, I don't know people who do that, but if that's a thing you do, then cool. Figure out if that raises your blood sugar or lowers it, and then figure out how to deal with the management of that. Syra, you want to talk about number two? <laughs> Yeah, so um, specifically for us, in case anybody doesn't know, we have three diabetics in our house, all three of us are looping, so there's there's a lot of alerts um, if we kept them all on. So um, I figured this out mainly when we started thinking about sending um, our daughter Isla to school, and um, I had, I, I drafted out this insanely long doctor's orders of like, here's everything we do to manage for blood sugars. And my endo was like, well, that's nice, but no teacher's ever going to do all of those things. So let's cut out all the things that don't absolutely require their attention. So top priority being lows, right? And even then it was like, you don't want, um, you don't want teachers to be reacting, reacting to double arrows down because that might level up, especially with loop. So essentially limiting your alerts to what you know you will actually act on versus the ones that will just freak you out when you hear them, right? Um, those double arrow up sounds are my, like, I hate those ones with a passion. Like, more than the double arrows down, the double arrows up where I'm like, ah, and it makes me feel like I did something wrong when those happen, right? Either I didn't bolus in time or I didn't enter a carbon, right? Whatever it is. Um, so knowing how you emotionally respond to things is really helpful as well to help you realize like, okay, that makes me rage bolus. Maybe I shouldn't have that sound going off, something along those lines. Like figuring out and noticing patterns in your own behavior according to the different um, alerts that you have. Maybe it's as simple as changing those alerts for a little bit. Um, I know one of the conferences I went to last year, there was an alarm, like that really fun Dexcom alarm where it goes like, it sounds like the, it's called Takata or something and it's like somebody dancing. And it started going off and the guy like started popping Skittles and we we're like, wait, what is that? He said, like, oh, that's my low alarm. And everybody in the room was used to the standard low alarm. And he was like, yeah, I, I grew deaf to the low alarm, so I changed it. And so having that, that helped me. And I, I went ahead and changed it to that one ever since. And it just feels more fun because it also reminds me of a time where I connected with somebody else with type one, which is always nice. So essentially finding different ways to make those alarms not be super annoying um, while also actually making you get off your butt to deal with things. Um, it's a tricky balance and it'll be different for everybody. 
Um, but it, the main thing being don't, don't put in, yes, you want to be alerted for absolutely everything. Um, and night times, I think, is when it gets the hardest um, because you want to make sure that you're actually going to wake up to it. So maybe at that time you make it the most annoying one. Um, but then also routinely changing it. I know I am the deepest sleeper ever. And ironically, when my husband is home, I will sleep through everything. My daughter's alarms, my alarms, his alarms, doesn't matter what it is, the cat like sitting on my face, like nothing will wake me up. But as soon as he's not home, for some reason in my head, like it's psychological, I know he's not there. So I wake up to everything. And I'm a really light sleeper when he's not around. Thank, thank goodness for that, because otherwise, um, I don't know if I'd wake up for, for things. And um, just kind of figuring out what does and doesn't work for you. And there's going to be days where you're just exhausted because maybe you were up all night the day before because of a low or because of whatever. Um, knowing what does and doesn't work for you, specifically at night, which is when I think most people are the most um, on edge is helpful. So whether that's using sugar mate, which is really helpful for us, um, because waking, I'll wake up from the phone call from sugar mate for when my daughter is low, but I don't use sugar mate for myself because I care more about her. <laughs> um, so like I have made it a rule, like we only use the most tools essentially for her. So sugar mate, all the extra things we, we use for her, right? All the alarms that I get on my phone. I don't have any alarms for myself. All the alarms are for her. Um, and that's just what works for us, right? I don't recommend it, especially if you're just dealing with your own diabetes, but like, um, I can often hear my husband's follow up telling me that I'm low versus hearing it on my own phone. Cause I don't need to hear it off of every single phone in the house. When we see my parents, it's really annoying because they have the follow up for both me and my daughter. And then it's like blaring on both my parents' phone when both of us are low and it's really frustrating. So I don't recommend having it on follow and on your phone and on night scout and like in all the different places possible um choose what works the best for you and kind of rotate through those because there are a lot of options for all the different types of alerts you can have so let's say you're sick of hearing the dexcom alert you you start using sugar mate and having them call you when you're at a certain point or let's say you're sick of sugar mates over to night scout being really annoying and then let's say you get scared, like sick of that you just kind of rotate through those Maybe once every quarter you switch it out um, to keep your brain kind of like fresh. I don't know. That helps a little bit. I think that, I don't know if this is true of a lot of people, but for me, I didn't even know when I started using Dexcom that you could change the tone of the alert mm -hmm. until I got so auditory, to, like trained into hearing and ignoring my low alerts that I went in and I said, there's got, I have to be able to like connect this to something else. I have to like, I need to hear something else in order to actually hear it in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing it. And I went in, I was like, oh, this is not oh. an issue. They have like eight <laughs> bazillion different tones I can choose. I'm not the only one that's complaining about this. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I, I'm under the understanding they're actually trying to add more tones to that because people have already gotten sick of all the ones that they have as options. Mm -hmm. So in the pipeline, they're looking to add more more tones to that, as far as I know. They should add like a custom one where you can just have like a really annoying person telling you something where you can just add in your own tone. So I could have Cassie screaming at me, you're low. You're low, wake up. <laughs> Quit um, sleeping. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay, um, our next uh, kind of larger topic for tips and tricks, tech and supply control. Um, I feel, <laughs> um, Glenn was the one who recently gave a really great charging station recommendation um, and also Riley Link uh, placement recommendation, which was to keep and act, like if you're dropping connection, one of the ways to mitigate that is to keep two Riley links around and to keep your backup Riley link on either the top of your bed or near the bed. Um, I don't, Glenn, if you would like to chime in to explain that a little bit further, cause I'm not being very clear. That was something that I heard recently and I was like, oh, 
I've never thought about keeping my backup Riley link in a different place in the bed I sleep in to mitigate the fact that I'm like dropping connection in the middle of the night and I just don't know it because I'm sleeping. Yes, yeah, so I, I leave my, I have my normal Riley link set up on a long cord so it goes up like to the top of the headboard. I, we have a tall headboard. And then the other one I'll put like near the foot of the bed, un not on a charger, and then I'll charge that the next day. And then for my charging stand, I, I use, just have a nice inductive charger that I just leave on the side that has a, a watch uh, spot on it. And it has the USB port on it that I use to charge the Riley link. So I'm kind of all in, integrated. There's so many options for charging things now. And Joanne, I remember when you were first starting to loop, we had lunch. And one of the first things you said was, I just don't know how I'm going to keep all this stuff charged all the time. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I, um, I followed uh, Glenn's suggestion about the backup Riley link. And I have a long charging cord and I have a high headboard and I have it plugged in hanging over the edge. And my husband looked at me and kind of said, is that our new decor? Um, and, it, and it is because it actually, um, I, used to lose connection at nighttime. So it really actually works. And um, I'd love to find out what Glenn's charging station is. I missed that one, but all good suggestions. Definitely keeping it above your head. Tessa, I plug hers in and then I, I just set it on the edge of the railing. She's in a, the lower half of a bunk bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, while plugged in, it just rests on the, um, the head area right above her head and keeping it up there versus like down on the actual charger that's right next to her bed um, can make a really big difference in connectivity. So getting it up above you, if possible, definitely prevents the, like you don't have the mattress and other things that can kind of be in the way, especially if you roll over um, and are smushing your pod, for example. So that can that can help reduce the, the potential like distance between you. And then just as a reminder, if you're gonna try to use two Riley links as a backup, that it will only flip to the secondary Riley link, the one you're not using, after three attempts, so 15 minutes of failure. So I think it's on minute 20, basically. Uh, the third or the fourth loop it tries to do, it'll actually drop. After the third one, it'll drop and then try to look for a new Riley link and then connect to it. So it doesn't immediately attempt you know, a loop with this one, and then right now, and then, oh, that didn't work, so I'll try the next one. It has to fail um, you know, basically three times in a row for it to try and switch Riley links. But it definitely is, a, I mean, if you have a backup, you might as well keep it in the cycle. It's good for the battery to be um, be used up and down. So by um, rotating it the way Glenn does, it keeps the battery working, make sure both of them are working, and it gives you a backup. Kenny, is it okay to keep the, uh, the backup Riley link plugged in all the time? I mean, yeah, in theory it should be because it does a, a good job of like turning off the power source for a little while and turning it back on when the battery dips a little bit. So it regulates its input, but it is good for the for lithium batteries to be more down like in the 50 to 60% range um, more often for storage. But um, being topped off is is fine, but I'd say using it is probably better to kind of get it used and make sure the battery's still working okay. Yeah, I've got... This is the charger I use. So it's, it's got a, a, um, a watch spot and then a couple of USB ports on the back for the uh, extra devices. Can you post that, um, the brand or the link in um, SoCal Loopers? Oh yeah, sure. That'd be great, thanks. Um, Costco. Well, we're like, because <laughs> that um, discussion that we were all in came from the fact that we have Riley Link backups. Um, <laughs> which we went through as dive buddies and made our go bags in case of emergency and addressed really early on that we need backups for everything, including every single charging cord that like exists in our looping lives. And it wasn't until we went through the act of making our go bags that I even thought about getting a backup Riley link charging cord. I had two Riley links, but I didn't have a backup charging cord. Um, 
And so I think a really good tip for, avoid, for helping you to avoid burnout or to help avoid the fallout of burnout while you're in it is making sure that you have the ability to charge all of your devices from the places you spend the most time, right? Like I'm in my car, I'm at home, and before COVID, I was in my office. So the fact that I was running around, <laughs> running between like, my office, my school backpack, which was like me in my car, um, and home, and only had a Riley Link charging cord at home is uh, not in my own best interest and probably is not in anyone's best interest. Um, and I would say it's super applicable, that same idea when it comes to making sure you're ready for supply day changes. Um, I have been caught out without an extra pod or without extra reservoirs and infusion sites more times than I would like to admit. Um, and instead of having to like, like get frustrated, leave your office, go home, change out your infusion sets or your pod, just keep some extras at your work. Um, keep them in your desk so that if you need to do a middle of the day, I ripped my infusion set off on my office doorknob, which happens to uh, everybody in, in time. Um, you have the ability to do that without causing any frustration to yourself or interrupting your workflow, right? Especially once we all get to go back to our offices. Um, Let's not leave them once we're allowed to go back to them. <laughs> just camp out in them for a while. Um, I, I just want to talk to that for just for a quick moment. Um, the first time I'd knocked off a pod, it was on my arm, and I was actually at a going away party for you, Cassidy, in um, oh, San Juan, in Colorado. Colorado. And uh, walking back to the car, I, I guess I walked too close to a street sign and knocked it off. We were not planning to go home at that point but we turned the car around and went home. So yes, having a backup is a great idea, plus uh, good insulin, because you'll need that if you have to replace your pod. Mm -hmm. I've become prone to carrying um, insulin pens in my purse to use specifically in case of an emergency changing of a pod or an infusion set depending on which type of loop i'm doing um i just leave my vials at home and don't worry about them um okie doke next our favorite thing <laughs> carb counting <laughs> um just carb counting i feel like is generally the bane of existence for anyone living with diabetes gotta do it hate doing it um, Sarah, do you want to address some carb counting tips? Unmute you. There we are. Um, so yeah, so we have to do it all the time. Um, and I, I just, we need every tool to make it easy. Um, and Cassidy has some great things on this slide about <laughs> buying measuring cups and spoons that are helpful and make you smile, things that will make you want to carb count. And I really hate, I, I don't like thinking about diabetes. And so I have come across being very, um, I know how much I eat. I know how much, um, because I've measured it so many times. Um, and so I try not to keep um, having to uh, measure my carbs all the time. Um, but once in a while, meals start not turning out how I thought they would be. And, and I start thinking, I'm like, oh, I wonder what that was. Oh, it's nothing. I'll just go back and then next meal, I'll be like, oh. <laughs> and because we do, we vary how much we're eating um, from time to time. And I really, I've, I've found that um, getting back on track is really important because then as soon as we brush up on our, our carb counting, it makes such a big difference in our treatment. So I, I find that when I input every single thing I eat um, into an app, I use uh, MyFitnessPal, I've used Lose It before, um, and investing in a, in a really good uh, food scale with grams um, and ounces marked on there. Um, 
will really like take the question out of how much I'm actually eating and inputting it and taking a look at the like I also dose, I follow a pretty low carb diet, so I can dose better seeing the fat and the protein and taking a little extra insulin here or there. Um, but having, weighing it really helps me see like, oh, that's why I went high last time um, because this has like 20 grams of, of protein. I didn't realize that I had had that much protein in it, so I need to take more next time. And so I'll, I'll try the meal again and be like, okay, well now that, that worked. Um, and the other thing is is that I have three kids and making dinner, like Cassie was talking about eating noodles, are you like you they might have a snack and I might take something and, and be like, Why am I trending up? Isn't my basil? And so going back to my fitness um, my fitness pal and and really like not allowing myself to eat anything unless I input it keeps me really honest and and it it makes me second um, think twice, I guess, before I I will take something that they're eating or, um, yeah, and not dose for it because every little bit really does change what our numbers end up being. Um, so I, I felt that once in a while, if things aren't going the way there's, I'm assuming that they will, <laughs> using using these apps it is really great. And I, I don't recommend doing it all the time because it can be... Um, it's really tedious and and I really I don't I get frustrated having to do something and stop and so I'll do it for just a couple days until till I feel like the numbers are, are responding how I how I expect it and usually um, I'm able to make the adjustments and move, and move forward with that um, but then also with my fitness pal you can take a recipe I do I cook a lot from scratch and so you can take that recipe URL and say you say you made like um, I make a low carb coffee cake and so I cut it perfectly into six slices with and or 16 slices and then I divided that by the recipe to see how much each portion is and so I can really be sure um, what I'm eating um, it's just because I'm not always relying on food labels um, to to dose um, and sometimes those food, food labels really aren't correct also so even if it's like I'm just I'm like oh I'm just I just had a handful of chips or or something like taking those whatever that little item is and actually weighing it really makes a big difference I found in in accurate carb counting and even if I'm not in my carb counting frame of mind um, of weighing and measuring everything. Um, if I have a total meal failure, it really makes me mad. <laughs> so I'll go back after the meal and I'll input every single thing that I, I just had just to see like where was I off and how can I prevent this from happening next time. And, and sometimes it is just way more protein than I expected or sometimes I'll make something and there'll just be way more carbs in it than I had anticipated. So those are, those are my tips, I guess. When I had the glass noodles with my aunt at the Thai restaurant, I was like, I don't, I didn't realize this was a carb bomb. Like, what? Why? I don't, I must, what I see. And then doing the Google search after, I was like, oh no, I was so far off. I was like 100 grams of carb away from being correct. It wasn't even close. Um, and the tip here about, um, carb counting, like not doing it every day. That tip was given to me by a wonderful dietitian that I worked with in New York when I was training for Bike Beyond. Um, she is a type one diabetic. She is also a professional weightlifter and she was just a godsend, but she told me you're going to totally burn out if you set the bar for yourself that you're going to carb count, weigh, and measure every single morsel of food that goes into your mouth. It's just not the appropriate thinking for a person who lives a full, well-rounded, interesting life. So she said, just at the beginning, carb count every other day. Once you feel like you're getting those meals down and you're actually getting like, she said, instead of just eyeballing the portions, actually give reference to them, like the initial palm and like finger references that we all learn really early in our carb counting days. She said, you know, actually use them so that you have a reference on your body at all times, right? 
Um, once you start doing that and you're really good at doing it every other day, only do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Once you're really good, it's okay to only do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But what wasn't okay, according to her, was just abandoning carb counting completely. Um, and the way that I was able to adjust to that mindset was by saying, you know, am I supposed to bolus when I'm eating some peanuts? Yeah, I know I'm supposed to, but the blood sugar impact is so minimal that I don't have to. Um, and that got me into some trouble with like just snacking in general, thinking small snacks wouldn't totally throw off my blood sugar. And that's how I ended up getting into um, every place I've lived, except for the current place I've been quarantining, has multiple sets of outrageously cute measuring cups because I use them as bowls. Use them as bowls and glasses because I know exactly how much food is inside of them, right? When, I'm, when my blood sugar is low and I need four ounces of juice or eight ounces of juice, I can't trust myself to like put that juice into a measuring cup and then transfer that juice into a cup or a glass and then drink it. One, I don't wanna wash all those dishes. Two, I just can't be trusted to do that. I'm just gonna go to the gallon of apple juice and start chugging it out of there. Um, so if I, <laughs> I like definitely utilize cute things um, to just make me feel better about potentially not doing sloppy carb counting. Um, our next set is coming to breaks, which are, which I realized recently, Glenn's never even thought of taking a pump break, which shocked me. Um, <laughs> cause I feel like taking tech breaks, uh, is key to my like <laughs> health and wellness and mindset. Um, I don't know how everybody else feels about them though. Any, anyone gotten some ideas about taking breaks? I, I also don't take breaks. And um, I remember that discussion. And, and, you know, and maybe, I'm sorry, Glenn, but, you know, maybe we're just older than you. And um, you have so much time ahead of you that you burn out thinking about it and go, I got to have a break. We're closer to the other end of it and go, yeah. It's not that much time we can do it i don't know i think it's more personality um i just don't take breaks because i don't think i'd come back so on that point i took my first break this year ever since i started pumping at least by choice um and i used to i was that person who didn't want to go on a pump initially because i didn't want to be tethered back then patch pumps were not even a thing I got, you know, tubing stuck on doorknobs too many times. It was like, F this, don't want to do it. I don't want something on me all the time. I was also in high school and didn't want to like have everybody see my diabetes because back then it was called a pager and like there's so many reasons for it, right? Um, and then after, you know, I finally got on one, I was like, this is amazing. How could I like, I don't remember life before it. I don't want to, like, I will never give this thing up. Um, and then I started on Omnipod like about a year ago. Well, as soon as it became available on, on Loop, that was when I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this thing out. And um, I've like switched on and off between that and, and the Medtronic pumping, which is now with everything else, that, else that's available, the Medtronic pump looks, still looks medieval because it's pretty much the same one that I had when I was first diagnosed. Um, and the Omnipod has, it's got a larger footprint on your body, right? So there's more adhesive. Um, there's just a significant difference in when you're wearing that versus the pump. So even though there's a lot of pros to it, there's a little bit of a con where it's like, even something as simple as doing yoga, you have to think a little bit more about it when you've got a pot on your back and you're like, oh, this is a really uncomfortable spot. Now. Like, I love it like that. <laughs> Right, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna do shavasana on, on my side today because this is where my pot is. Like other people don't think about that while they're doing yoga. And sometimes you're like, you know what? I don't want to think about where my devices are and have a compression low in the middle of the class. Like whatever it is. Like, um, and the point is that I finally took my first pump break um, very recently, like um, right before. So I, there's a couple of reasons for it, but 
my actual main reason for taking a tech or pump break at this point wasn't because of the device itself. It wasn't because of what it felt like on my body or anything like that. It was actually because of all the issues or all the things that you think about, everything that you just listed around, like the mental burden around, um, around looping, right? As amazing and wonderful as it, as it is, it's a little bit more work than even somebody that's on a 670G or a tandem, right? Because they can kind of just be like, all right, we know that this means this, right? Like whether it's you just go ahead and bolus it. I don't, I don't really know too much about how tandem works, but like, I don't think it'll cut your basal off for any, for any reason, right? Like I don't, unless it's like basal IQ and it says you trending down. Whereas with loop, if you mess up a card count, it changes everything for the rest of that, like the next however many hours. Um, if you mess up on the absorption time for that food, let's say you ate Chinese food and you accidentally just entered it all in as like three hours when really you should have done it two hours and a five hours. And you know that, but you were lazy and you were hungry and you were low or whatever. And you didn't go back and change it. Like there's so many things and that's just, it's a little bit more work because it's more data that you have to get right. Um, it's a lot more uh, control in one, in one way because you are in charge of, of everything. And I think the people that like to loop are the people who like to have that control. But more often than not, if you're looping, you're somebody who wants to have a, a more um, targeted range of blood sugar, right? Like you're not okay with Medtronic's, maybe you're 180 when it says, you know, you're really 120 kind of a thing. Um, and with loop, it's just, it's, it's a lot more that you have to have gotten right. And that's a lot of pressure, right? And um, so for me, that was, that was the reason I switched to the in pen for a little bit as my break because it was like here's a little less data that I have to keep track of like I can just be like huh that looks like three grams and it's part of like the mental burnout concept but giving yourself permission to do that whether it's for a week and my timing range didn't change significantly um which was kind of interesting to see I think I went from like I went down by like three percent in my timing range which is not that bad um, and then I got to not have to worry about where a device was for a couple of weeks. Like it's it's nice to have a break from having to think about it all the time and be like, wait, I have to go back and think about what carbs I put in, when I put them in, did I actually put them at the exact time I ate? Um, all the different things that you guys know that we do every day. Um, or, hey, did I put in that override when I should have? Like it's that time of the month. Did I remember to put in my override or not? Like it would be really nice if they could have that synced where you have like those, those trackers that are like, Hey, you should probably think about putting your override on now because you forgot. Um, there's just, there's so many different things that happen and, um, there's a million and one reasons you might want a break. And that, that was just one of mine from the, from the tech standpoint. Are you still you doing your in pen break or are you off? I just switched back only because I would have had to start a new Traceva pen and I wasn't ready to commit to a whole Traceva pen, but I'm ready to go back to it. Yeah, I, I also would like to say that, that there's certain things with diabetes. I mean, we have no choice in having this disease. And if we think about this being a choice of using this technology and using our treatment, there's so many options that are available to us now. When I was first diagnosed, when I was 11, there were shots. You were stuck with shots. Um, and it was what I was comfortable with because that was the only thing I knew. So I never, when the first pumps came out, I was like, oh, I don't want to be connected to something. I like shots. Shots are fine. Um, so I finally went on a pump when I was 20. And it was, it was, it changed my life, you know, and it made things a lot, a lot easier. Um, but when I first, I, I would say about when I first started my do it yourself pumping, um, I, I did get burnout. Um, I was finding that my settings were totally off. Um, and I was, my A1C was a lot better, but I, I've somehow updated to a new branch of something and it, um, and my, I was going like this and I was getting like these little helpful things that weren't really helpful because my settings are off. And I was just like, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm low again. And my husband's like, you seem like you're low all the time. And I was like, I know, I don't know what's happening. And, and I was like, I just, I need to stop because I was becoming really like, just, I had a high anxiety level and too much tech at some points isn't like helpful to our mental well-being, and so I was 
I, for me, needed to know that I could control my diabetes without tech. With my CGM, yes, I, I definitely, I would never go off my CGM. Um, but with, with using this other system, I, I just, I had to put it aside and go back to shots and say, okay, is this easier? Is this better? or not better? How is my quality of life now? Now that I'm going back on shots, and so for me, I'm on a really low insulin dose, and so doing shots, it was so hard because I would be slightly higher, but then I would only need like a teeny tiny bit. I was like, on my pump, I would do 0 0.2, but how do you do that with a needle? And and then I was I was trying to figure out the, the overnight basal, and it was never the same. And so some nights I would be low and waking up, and I, so, I had to take a step back and reassess, like, well, now that I'm doing this, okay, I'm, I'm fine. It's totally fine. I can make this work, too. But what is my quality of, my, of life? Is quality, my quality of life any different? Is it any better? Um, what can I do to make my quality of life um, better from where I am right now? And, and so having that peace of mind of knowing that my pump was going to shut off, um, in the middle of the night was was something that I was missing when I when I couldn't fight, figure out my my tracebo overnight. Um, the timing was just always it was always off. Or um, and so I don't I don't think it's healthy for us to feel trapped that we need these devices. Um, they're supposed to be an asset. So for me, I always reassess and like just looking at my data, trying to figure out you know, what could be causing these lows and not giving up um, until I can figure out mentally, like, is, is it the device? Is something wrong with my device? Would I be easier? Would it be easier if I just got rid of it? I'm, I'm constantly reassessing and I'm always coming back to loop, you know, being, being the better way. Um, because it does, it takes a lot of the guesswork out and, and I get to think about diabetes a lot less um, doing doing these systems, so I I I feel like that's that's why I stick with it. But I think it's very individual, and and we do have a choice. Um, so I think it's important not to to think you don't have a choice. I feel like uh, I get, I end up making myself really fortunate when it comes to breaks and reminders about how great Loop is and has been for me because I go completely back to MDIs every time I go backpacking. So like any time I'm going on a backpacking trip, even if I'm just doing like an overnight, if I'm only going out for like two days in a night or like two nights, three days, there I just like don't want to carry any of the weight or deal at all in tech out in the middle of the woods. So I always just go back to MDIs. And by the time we're back at the campsite and I'm like, yeah, that's like, we saw this beautiful lake, we did great fishing, you know, whatever, like great camping trip. I'm like in the car actively trying to like get devices back on me, um, especially loop now because it's just like, it's sleeping through the night. It's like not questioning things all the time and definitely the ability to like not have to keep everything in my head all the time. Um, I think I, I, like, I come back to it and I'm like, yeah, this is great. Like, even a couple, what was a month ago when I was headed totally into burnout, I was like, yeah, I think I'm just going to like take a break from tech. And Joanne was like, yeah, sure. Do it. Like nothing bad's going to happen. Like yeah. you're going to take a break and then you're going to come back here because looping is I great. Think that's the most <laughs> powerful part. <laughs> like that, that feeling of choice and like autonomy over what you do with your diabetes. Like what Sarah was saying is like, you have a choice. I think that's the most powerful part of taking a break, whatever that break looks like whether your break is physically taking a pot off and using shots, or maybe your break is widening your range and being like, all right, you know what, for a week, I'm going to let myself go up to 200 or two, whatever your threshold for um, your range is, whether it's, you know what, I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn my higher alarm off for this next week and give yourself a deadline of like, I'm going to check back in with myself and see if I still need this break, right? Whether that was whatever, whatever your break looked like, right? Um, for me, I have a unique situation where I can literally hand my tech over to my husband who's also looping and be like, can you just pull us all my meals for me this week? Like, I just don't want to deal with it. I can't deal with it. Can you just be my person? And he's like, yeah, okay. Cause, and I don't have to teach him how to do it. Um, and another one that's, I think we've, I, I don't know if I mentioned this one last time, but um, that's been helpful for me is sometimes just not wearing my watch. 
Like I love bolusing for my watch, but just not wearing it even for a day is really nice to not feel that buzz and like, like just be able to always see it is kind of nice. Um, be like, hey, it's it feel I feel a little less like Inspector Gadget when I take it off. Um, like uh, that's Cyber, there's that's, a question. That's nice. there, there's a question from uh, Julie saying, did you take your break during the COVID staying at home? She doesn't feel confident necessarily doing that while she's working. When did you I did, yes, um, I did, but I'm trying to think of the last time I've ever taken one before. Mm, yeah, I can't speak to ever having taken, when you say like loop break or pump break, because I've taken a loop break before, um, which was still just pumping, but not, not with loop. I basically like checked right a link when it was, when I got too many red loops one time and was like, I'm done with you for a little bit. I'm just gonna use Medtronic the way it it normally does for a while. Um, but I took my pen break during COVID. Um, my specific reason is also a, a unique situation where um, during Ramadan, I was looping and there was no room for error for any of it because you end up having to break your fast, right? So the the mental stress of loop was a little bit exacerbated in during Ramadan because it's like the stakes are even higher. And so I felt like, even more of a burnout, even more of a need to take a break from all of that and be like, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go back to shots for a while. Um, so my reason for it was a little bit different, but I think everybody has different levels of that, whether it's just your own standards of your care for yourself or whatever it is. Um, but for the in-pen break for that long, I have not done it with in-pen specifically pre-COVID. I know a lot of other people who have. I know Kenny has used the, um, has switched on and off between loop and shots for his daughter a few times, and that's both with and without COVID. Um, I know a lot of other people who do, and I'm sure if you asked about it on the Facebook group, other people would be able to share their experience. I guess my question around that is why you wouldn't feel confident doing it in any other setting is because you think there'd be more, you're less like confident around not being at home during it, and is it an option to do it over the weekend to kind of be like, okay, I have two days to make sure that I feel comfortable that I won't go low during, maybe you have 10 a.m. meetings all the time, right? And being like, I know I won't have to deal with anything at that point. Um, something like that that would make you feel more confident in it, or even just saying, hey, I'm only going to do it over the weekend, and maybe that's all you need, because that's what's really nice about chats is there's no three days before you have to switch it out or feel like you didn't waste anything, right? Um, that's a nice thing where it's like, okay, I can literally just do shots for a day and then slap another pot on or put on another infusion on, or even if you're on a Medtronic pump, you could keep your infusion on and still do like untethered pumping if you wanted, or like there's so many different variation of variations of what you could do and how you can do your break and seeing what doesn't doesn't work for you. Yeah, we've done um, breaks. I mean, I don't know if it works much better when you, or if it's harder, but my daughter's basal is pretty low compared to her carb ratio. So we'll do breaks now if my daughter wants one, I try to convince her to do um, just a day break. And so that way I get to sleep still a little easier. And we were pretty good at getting her level at night um, before loop, but it's still more work. Um, so, so I guess, how would you handle it during school, Kenny? Yeah. That so, the main... yeah, if you're going to do like during school, if she, she hasn't, well, she has done it actually. If she's willing to give her own shots, it's fine. So what we've done is just no Lantus, no long acting. So we'll plan for it. We'll wake up in the morning and, you know, when her pod's going to expire or whatever, and we'll take it off. Um, I have sometimes tried to arrange when she really wants one. I try to hold her off a couple of days till we can like sync up a pod expiring in the morning. So I get the whole night and then we take it off and she runs all day without it. And so she is usually at that point because she wants the break is willing to either to do a shot at school and then we do it, you know, for her. At night, you just you just end up like using a little bit heavier carb ratio to compensate for the fact that you don't have any basil. You're most likely to eat a few times a day, at least a seven-year-old is. So, um, but then we put it back on when she goes to bed, so then everyone gets to sleep. So, uh, and then you only have to if you're using the impen, it makes it easy because it logs all the doses in the in Apple Health for you. Otherwise, you just have to go back and catch them all up. Um, I think the hardest bed. part about taking one of those like pen breaks or loop breaks is kind of remembering that you don't have temp basils to fall back on so that was the hardest part for me to be like oh shoot I actually need to be a lot more aggressive with my carb counting or not carb counting but my my bolus is yep. 
than I've ever been more than I have been recently because I'm so used to Luke like catching it for me. Yeah, and um, for us, for us, we were pretty heavy bolusers on pens and needles before, so it's just like, all right, I turned down the carb ratio calculation in my head, and we just kind of give a little bit extra, because we're trying to avoid her having extra shots, too, so I'm like, well, she's yeah. probably going to eat again in another two hours, so. I feel like the, like, uh, the takeaway point here is like, yo, do you want a tech break? You want a range break? Do it. Yeah, like, take short ones, and like, live your life. Come back to the tech, because it's great, and we all love it. And the other, I think our second to last, not last yet, um, our second to last um, practical tip and trick are the things that Joanne is really good at giving reminders about, which are lean into the things that you love, the things that make you happy. If you are feeling like you're headed toward diabetes burnout or you are actively in a like time period or a session of burnout, don't dig yourself further into the hole. <laughs> yeah, I'll just jump in real quickly. Um, so having had diabetes for fi over 55 years, um, I've gone through periods of ex extreme distress. And what I learned from all of that is once you go through extreme distress, you gotta climb back out of it. And um, that makes me tired. This discussion is making me a little tired all the parts of it makes me tired. Um, and all it wants me to do, um, it looks like we're babysitting a dog tonight who just came in a little while ago and I thought, well, that's good, I can cuddle her. Um, it's do the things that help you be resilient. Um, resilience is kind of the key, I think, to managing this disease. So if carb counting bothers you, lighten up. It's um, by the way, there's a really, really great um, article in the New York Times by Steve Martin um, as a as a honor to Carl Reiner, a comedian who passed away recently. And the two takeaways were um, funny it up because things are too serious sometimes, and lighter is happier, lighter is funnier. And and I and I kind of believe that the more you can smile, the more you can feel good inside. A giggle will get your diaphragm moving, which is a physiological change in your body. Um, if journaling helps you get it out of your brain, dancing, moving, uh, disappearing into a good book or a movie. Um, I always think it's real, real important to do something for somebody else. Um, if you think you are stressed you got to believe you're so smart to be doing this stuff that there are others that aren't able to do this that need maybe even more help. So always reach out during COVID, contact people, just let them know you're thinking about them because people do get stressed. And so I, that's just kind of my go-to is help people bounce back, help people understand. And, and with loop, I, I've had the last couple of days have been just really pretty horrific for a variety of reasons with my blood sugars. And, and I know what those reasons are. Um, and yet I come back to, I'm just grateful for it. I'm grateful to Kenny that I wake up every morning at 99 to hundred and I don't know how it even gets there sometimes, but it does. And I look at it and go, I, I hate this technology. I hate the things hanging off my headboard. <laughs> but I, I, I am grateful for it, and um, it has made my life better. Um, I'm tired of it. The lists are tiring. Uh, lots of things are tiring. So um, do something fun and, and take a break from it. And if you need a pump break, take a pump break. Just be kind to yourself. You know, just kind of lighten up a little bit because uh, we won't be on this planet for at least not for another hundred years. So during this time, have a good time and have as good a time as possible. So that's my thinking. If you feel upset, just send me a private message. I'll bring you around. Um, and, I, and I do believe laughter is really, really important. Um, I follow a group in uh, upstate New York called the Humor Project, and they give corporate seminars on the importance of laughter and bringing joy into people's lives. And, and I think that's important. So that's, that's my go-to. And if nothing else, go pet a dog or a cat. Find something fuzzy. <laughs> it's always going to make you smile. 
Um, and our like very, very last section of tip here, my very favorite one, um, is your dive buddies. And I'm so happy to do this one because it's you guys. Um, uh, for anyone who has not heard us talk about dive buddies, pay attention and go find them. Um, also, if you guys are commenting on this Facebook Live, maybe your dive buddy is in the comments with you. Um, we are like, <laughs> the admins of this group are like blood bound to one another to like <laughs> talk diabetes and care for one another. And while we have all of the controls and the infrastructure in place to do that in situations of dire emergencies for any one of us, that also is super impactful when it comes to the general daily management of T1D and the general daily management of running do-it-yourself technology. Um, I've said 8,000 times within this now that like, these guys are the ones that pulled me out of my most recent bout of burnout. And I, it, I will be fortunate if I can do the same to them because I feel so fortunate that they were able to help me. So if you find your dive buddies, seek them out, love them well, hold them close, and thank them when they help you through your hey, Can I just jump in here on diabetes? Because we've talked about this and we, you and I have really discussed how do people find their little core group. And you can't just advertise and say, I want a diabetes. Um, but I think what you have to evaluate for yourself is how do I manage my diabetes? Would an outsider say, I'm doing this well or I have some issues? And, and what can I bring to the party that someone else would want to lean on me? So um, I don't think any one of us are perfect, but um, I need to be able to trust that my diabetes will come back from their little slumps and be available to help. And as you connect in the community, that's where you'll find your diabetes. It's kind of hard to put an ad in Craigslist for a diabetes. But any kind of support groups, any kind of fundraisers that are diabetes related, start to get a circle of friends. And from there, you can say, hey, can we back each other up? And, and it becomes an amazingly powerful force to feel protected that way. I think that's a great place for us to end the evening. Okay, great. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, Great job, Cassidy. Absolutely great job. Thank you. Cassidy should get credit for creating this entire slideshow. You bet. Thank you, everybody. I hope you Good all night, have everybody. a peaceful evening and uh, stay in touch. Good night, everyone. Good night.